Eric Burgess here with Music Marketing TV, and today we're going to be taking a look at using Melodyne to do some pretty fun things with drums. There's going to be two parts to this, or two videos per se, and in this video we're going to be looking at things like useful form and shifting, pitch shifting, and time stretching. So these are techniques that often when they're used, they just don't seem like something I would ever actually use. So I want to give you some cases uh, that I have personally used them. I, I make a lot of electronic music, and so these are very useful techniques for me. I would not use this stuff on like a country song or something. That would just, they would be really out of place. So let's go, let's take a quick look at an example. So here we are, and let me show you just our drum loop that we're working with. Now this drum loop could sound great all on its own for a while, uh, but we could definitely add some things to it if your track has room for some more percussive interest. So let's just uh, hear this. <laughs> let's uh, unsolo everything. That's our drum loop. It's a nice loop. You can mix it in. There's some room. Got a, a sort of a fat snare. Got some nice two kicks. Great. There's some hi-hats in here too that I, I just wasn't showing. I just decided to sort of keep it to the things we're going to be messing with. Because so that brings us to the first point. We're going to change stuff. You want to change key elements. You could do a lot of fun things with hi-hats, but I would treat hi-hats entirely separately because the ability to pitch shift and move around hi-hats can almost borderline on like just a completely separate melodic instrument. So we're going to be looking at doing things that will enhance the drum loop without making it like the center of attention, if you know what I'm saying. Just adding a little bit of flair here and there. So in Melodyne, let's hear the Melodyne version. Let's uh, open Melodyne too. Why, why don't we? So here's the Melodyne version. So it's still the drum loop. Like it's still very recognizably the drum loop, but there are a couple moments in here. We have some kick drums moving around, some snares doing some small shifts, and they don't do it in a way that seems like, ugh, like this seemed kind of random or weird. They did it in a way that built with the phrase. It made sense in the context of the drum loop. It did not do anything to sort of detract from that. The only move that I would say maybe is distracting is the form and shift. This guy right here, this form and shift, is the only one that I would say this is an idea or, or something that we've done that would really pull the listener's attention to be like, well, that was a sudden change in a way I didn't sort of expect. And that can really do well in the context of the music um, as far as like picking where you're going to put those. Because there are moments that, you know, we might want to draw them to the drums. So I decided to include a couple of those. But a lot of times uh, when people do stuff like this, they kind of shy away from it because they do a lot of this and it, that typically won't work out that great. So let's take a look here at this first bit. And there's a lot going on in the first measure, and let's talk about the phrase real quick too, how to get a phrase that this will work with. So the key thing to notice, especially in the original, is that the phrase repeats three times. It's a very clear phrase. And then on the fourth, Right there, we get our break. Something different happens, and then we do it again. So it has a lot of uh, expectedness. We expect things to happen, but they're pretty satisfactory results because of the way we've structured the beat, right? It builds up. Like you, you want that to happen. And so we're going to take advantage of that. So the first thing I do is, and there's a couple of mixing benefits also that come with this sometimes. Uh, so... We have our kick, 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 and this is something I keep consistent. I'm not going to mess with the kick, kick, kick at the beginning, the dut, the dut, because I want something to have that the listener can anchor to and sort of say, oh, this is where we are. Oh, this is where we are. And so I'm going to use that as my sort of my anchor. And you're going to want to pick things in your phrases that are going to be anchors. If you mess with everything, it's going to be just really distracting and usually doesn't turn out that great. Uh, the next thing is we're going to ignore this move. This was sort of a special experimental move that just happened to work out. Uh, we've got these here, these pitch shifts. Now, when we choose notes to pitch shift, 
there should be a phrase in mind. You shouldn't just randomly pitch shift things. You should pick notes that are usually weaker notes that are going to push to a strong note. Every now and then you can pitch shift a strong note, but a lot of the time, my, like for example here, we do the pitch shift, but when we land, now this is technically a weaker beat, but it pulls us to a really strong beat. And so there's this notion of, of phrasing with our pitch shifting. Uh, this I think this kind of goes without saying, but I'm going to say it just to be clear. If you've never heard of this sort of thinking, you want to think in the phrases. You want to be like, okay, I don't want to move this note around because that's where we're resolving to. So we don't, uh, rhythmically, that's where we're going to land. And since we're adding in this idea of small tonal shifts, we don't want to be adding in these ideas on spots that are supposed to be resolutions because then they'll they'll just be a little bit confusing when we get to them. Uh, let's just hear it and just, you can now listen for this specifically. So you see that's, that there's a lot in that little phrase, a lot of groovy stuff going on, but it's like, it's all right there. And we have this sense of down and up. And these are the kinds of things that I really like to do. So we have this down and up. Uh, let's talk about this, this longer blob right here, a time elongated blob. You click it and you can, you can drag them out and whatnot. A lot of times this does not work to sound all that awesome, uh, like right out of the box. Usually it requires a lot of fiddling. This one just so happened that when I, when I time elongated it, it just happened to sound great. They added in that little yip sound that you're hearing. It wasn't in the original loop that you heard earlier at all. This comes from just time stretching that thing. And I was like, mm, that's really cool. So I left it right there. That's the only one I really use. Um, I see a lot of examples where people use like snares and things, which can be really cool. But a lot of times I've just never used that and been happy with the result. So that's, that's just my own experience right there, but there you go. So we've got this kick. We're doing our phrasing over here. We have another pitch shift. Let's hear that one. And you see right there, another very clear phrasing. And this time I left the phrase mostly alone. There, there is going to be times where you're not going to want to touch what you have. We wrote a cool thing already. We don't need to change it all the time. We have this dun, 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 dun. And by doing this pitch shift, we push our shell, we push our shelves, we push the phrase into the next measure. And that's really, really powerful musically. Something you don't usually get to do with drums because drums don't have the ability to do what we're introducing here. So a very cool sort of phrasing idea. Again, we're going to mess with the triplets and we're going to resolve back down just like we did over here. So it's a reuse of the idea. And it's just a little bit different with the uh, shifting. And here I should also point out that since we're moving our kick around, uh, sometimes this can come in and out or drop in and out of your mix, depending on what you're doing. And sometimes this can be a bit of a favor. It adds a little bit of breath to your mix. A lot of times we set the kick in a spot and the kick just hits that spot. And we spend a long time making this spot sound really good. But having a little bit of movement around it, I find in a lot of the tracks that I really dig that have a, especially like funky ones, this is like, this is amazing. It fits so well and it just adds so much more to the drums. At least I think it does. Drummers may disagree, but... That's, that's just a, a nice mixing thing I've noticed as I've, I've worked with stuff like this. Uh, let's keep going over here. Now here, I'm going to touch the snare. Snare touching, as I've already said, is a tricky topic. Um, it's not, what, not one you want to get wrong. And so here I use the snare, but I use it in a way that builds with the phrase and um, ends in an overarching phrase. Let's hear it from the, let's hear this first four bars again. But this time, I want you to pay attention to the overarching phrase and how the snare sort of ties it up for us, or at least builds a small climax. That will bring us into the next four bars. And right there, since this is a break, and the snare increases, we ha and then it comes back down, and we have our push again with the kick kick. That all serves to say, hey, this was a phrase, a drum phrase, where before this would have just been like, oh, this one was different, so we know it's the end of the phrase. So we've enhanced it a bit, and we've used snare shifting. I didn't, I tried time stretching, I didn't really dig it, so I just sort of left it as is. And we've created here a phrase that has a lot more information for the listener to take in. 
and it adds a lot of interest to the track. This is something you could totally try doing with your drums. Again, I find it works better with electronic stuff. Sometimes it's a bad idea, you don't wanna do it. And the original was fine. If you have a lot of stuff going on in your song, if you have, a, uh, especially if it's high information stuff, meaning, you know, there's a complex melody or there's singing or there's just a lot of parts, doing this to your drums could be a, a bad idea. But if you've got room and maybe you want your bass to groove, I find that if you do this wisely and in spots that build phrases, you could have melodies respond to drums and then you could have another response and another sound and you could get some really organic sort of talking back and forth between your sounds that you just typically don't see because people aren't doing weird stuff with their drums all the time. Now there is, a there is one other move in here that you can do. But if we actually go to the formants tool, we can change the formants of the drums. And you see, I've done this in a couple spots. And what this does is this can really mess with the timbre of the drum. And so this is another thing we could use, especially if we have like a part that's like going bow, wow, 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 wow. And then you have a drum fill. You could have the resonance, the formancy parts of the drum, these things do something as a, and the fill at the same time, and it could be a lot more melodic at the same time. So here I just used it as sort of a static timbral shift. Uh, let's hear that. And that can work really well, it just depends on how you use it. You gotta get creative with it, right? I do find that uh, formant shifts up tend to be more noticeable and cut through and mix easier than formant shifts down. Just sort of makes sense. There's already so much usually going on in the low end you don't generally want to add additional things but it can be really cool and another thing i didn't do it here but something that is a, a good experiment if you really want like a, a mix that is just sort of like whoa um you could bounce these out but render out like a dry version in this version and then pan the formancy version differently and you can get some really cool spaces going on mix wise that I really dig it when I hear tracks that take advantage of this and you say, well, this is a weird. And then if you add reverb, but like different verbs, you can, you can get just some unusual spaces going. But anyways, that's a couple things you could do with Melodyne when it comes to drums. If you have any questions about this, let me know. If you make a sweet groove, make a sweet drum groove and share it with me. I sort of live for this sort of stuff. This is like, people ask me, what do I listen to? It's this kind of stuff. The stuff with the, with the breakbeat drums and they do cool things and they have cool sounds in the middle. I really like that sort of stuff. Subscribe, hit that bell icon, and have a blessed day.